Glory to God. I'm ready to get in the Word. Yes. And uh, if you brought your Bibles, open up to John 3.16. We're going to continue our series uh, today on Believe the Gospel. And uh, we've been, in the last couple of weeks, we've been uh, in talking about no condemnation, how to live a life of no condemnation, how to um, live out what the first part of the series was, right? We talked about um, repentance uh, to begin this series. And then we talked about forgiveness for about a month, three or four weeks. And uh, so now we are talking about no condemnation, how to live out the realities of, uh, of a life where we're forgiven completely, amen? And it's important that we started with repentance and forgiveness because you cannot live, you cannot live any kind of a life, uh, a kingdom life, based on anything that the gospel has to offer you, and you can't walk any of it out unless you're convinced, thoroughly convinced that you've been forgiven and you've changed your mind away from the religious attitude and away from the, the religious mindset of trying to, trying to you know, pull God over onto your side and, and make God be a friend of yours and, and really convincing God that you're worthy. And, and see, the gospel in itself says that you were not worthy and Christ Jesus, because of his sacrifice, made you worthy. Amen? Amen. That's the whole gospel. And so uh, what we have then is a, um, a life of no condemnation that many people, many believers never step over into. And so I want to share some truths from the Word this morning um, that, are, that are going to really minister to us. John 3.16 is one of the most well-known verses of Scripture, uh, probably the most well-known verse of Scripture. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life but have everlasting life. So the reason Jesus came was because God so loved. Amen. It's the reason he came. Jesus came because God loved you. Yeah. Jesus came because he loved the entire world. But now we find out in the very next scripture, the anti-reason that Jesus came, or the non-reason, if I can say it that way. It says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So, so many people know John 3.16 and don't have a clue what John 3.17 says. They know half of the gospel, that God so loved the world that he gave Jesus and that Jesus came and Jesus was a sacrifice for the whole world. They know that, and that is wonderful. I'm glad that anybody that knows that and believes on, on that revelation is saved, right? Anybody that calls on the name of the Lord and makes him Lord of their life, they're saved. But they live a life not understanding verse 17. And so they think that condemnation and they think the things of this world um, that are coming against them are at the very least allowed by God to teach them something, at the very least, or at the very worst, sent by God to, you know, grow them up in the word and grow them up in, in you know, a life of faith and those kind of things. And uh, it's very damaging, very damaging. And so I just... Uh, we, we began a couple weeks ago talking about no condemnation. We really were heavy in the book of Hebrews. I don't know if you remember that, Hebrews 8 and 9, what Jesus did, how he cleansed the heavenly utensils of worship. And I want to jump off from that thought here and get right into it because Jesus, um, what he did for you and what he did in the presence of the Father, he became the mercy seat. Jesus became the actual real mercy seat of which the Old Testament just had a type and a shadow, the Ark of the Covenant. Jesus became the mercy seat and his own blood was shed for us and keeps, now keeps all of God's uh, thoughts of evil toward his children away. The, the, the blood of Jesus has completely transformed Everything about what the enemy would try to do in you and through you and to you, the blood of Jesus eradicated all the power of that, but only to the degree that you understand that and you know what the blood of Jesus has done for you, will it operate in your life and be what God's called it to be for you in your life. Yes. Amen. <laughs> and so, um, but the, well, Revelation 12, 10, I'm going to read this really quickly. I think that I read it last week. The weeks have run together. This has been just a fun time. But verse 11 is well known. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. But verse 10 says, 
And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Now, this is 2,000 years ago. Now, the power, the power of the resurrection was enforced then. The power of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ has been in effect for 2,000 years, ladies and gentlemen. The power of the resurrection is at work in your life, and this is what it does. Watch this. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. But who did they overcome? The accuser. I want you to see that. The accuser, verse 10, the accuser of the brethren, uh, not just the world, the accuser of the brethren. Hear me now. The accuser of the brethren. He specifically, specifically says that the accuser is there for the purpose of coming against the brothers and sisters in Christ. The, the sinner, the person that's lost that hasn't received Jesus, they don't need accused. In fact, he encourages them. Hear me now. There's an encouragement there. The, the farther away they can go from revelation knowledge, the farther away that they go into darkness, the, the, the much the farther that they can travel into um, a place of, of not seeing any spiritual wisdom or revelation or anything like that, that's a good thing to the accuser of the brethren. He is enabling that, right? But now for the believer, the believer has a different issue with that wicked one, that great dragon, Beelzebub, Mammon himself, the spirit of Mammon himself. We have a different relationship with him because we're victorious over the enemy. But so many times people don't know they're victorious over the enemy. And what the accuser does is let us know that we're not doing a good enough job all the time. It's never good enough. You know, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter who you witness to. You could have witnessed to two more people. It doesn't matter how much word you got yourself into and dove into and what revelation you got. You could have got one more revelation, one more nugget, because that next nugget that you didn't get is the key to your breakthrough. And maybe it'll come in two weeks or three weeks. Breakthrough is always in the future. You guys are going to have to wake up this morning. Breakthrough is always in the future for where the enemy is concerned. But now where we're concerned, it's 2,000 years ago. It's a done deal. It's a fact. And it's truth. It's already been settled in the courts of heaven forever. We have been declared righteous by the Lord Jesus himself and by the heavenly father, the, the, the eternal judge of all the galaxies. He's already judged that wicked one. That wicked one has no authority anywhere in your life, but all he has is idle threats and accusations. You're not good enough. You're not, you know, you're not wise enough. You're never going to know this spiritual breakthrough, this revelation. Oh, it's lies, lies, lies from the very pit of the enemy. Yes. So that's the reason. That's the reason. Uh, turn to Romans chapter 3. Yes, Lord. Romans 3. We're going to get into some of the things about the law today. Uh, going to talk about some things. I will say this, Romans 3 verse 19. Romans 3, 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So whatever things the law says, what law? The Ten Commandments are the first part of it. And then there ended up being 613 total, uh, you know, the parts of the Mosaic Law. And there were there are all kinds of um, things that are written in the Old Testament. But it's not just that law. It's anything. So for the sake of uh, our discussion today and in the next couple of weeks that I preach, the law is anything that you think you have to do to become more righteous. I'm going to say that again. Anything you believe you have to do to become more righteous, to become more worthy, to become more accepted, to become more of an overcomer, anything you have to do, that's what I'm going to refer to as the law. 
So as we talk about this, it's not just the Ten Commandments. I want to set this straight right now. Now, there are people that look to the Ten Commandments and, and they think, yeah, I make sure I get, a, get all these right every day and those kind of things. And, and that's, that's a good thing that, you know, we want to be pleasing to the Lord. For sure. I'm not anti, um, I'm not anti the law. I'm anti the law making you righteous. The law can't make you righteous. In fact, Romans chapter 7 says the law is holy and just and good, but it'll never make you holy or just or good. The law can't do that. It's just like that red pitcher of Kool-Aid. The law can try to keep as much Kool-Aid out, but until the love of God flushes those things out, until the love of God and the very life of God, the Zoe life of God flushes out all of the other uh, things that would, that would keep you dead, right? And, and, and your soul, man, right? Your mind, your will, your emotions, the things that try to keep you away from walking a spiritual life until you allow those things to be flushed out by the word of God, by the life of God, by, by the joy and all the fruit of the spirit. Unless, until you allow that to happen, you're absolutely wasting your time. Wasting your time trying to make yourself more accepted. Yes. Yeah. Trying to make yourself more beloved trying to make yourself more worthy of receiving from Jesus. But the whole point is he made you worthy. <laughs> so Romans 3.19, the law says, well, everything the law says, it says to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The law's job is to make you feel guilty. The law's job is to make you feel guilty. I'm just going to let that rest on some of you because some of you may have never heard that before. You might think that the law was, were, they're, they're tools for us, pastor, so that we can become more acceptable to God. They're tools for us so we can be more righteous. They're tools so we can be better Christians. No, they're not. It's a mirror trying to show you how horrible you are. Just, you got to let that sink in. You've got to let that become part of your knower, exactly who you are. The law, in fact, the Ten Commandments were never given for man to keep. Right. And just, if it, here's the deal. When I say that, some of you are thinking, man, this guy has really lost his mind. Why else would God show, give us those? Well, the law was given not so we could keep it, but so we could finally realize that we can't keep it. And so we would look to somebody else better than us that can keep it and put our trust and our faith in somebody better than us who can keep us and make us righteous because of his righteousness. Amen. That's what the gospel is all about. And people are looking at the law as a means to an end. The law was given to show us that we were at the end of ourselves. You're supposed to come to the end of yourself because only when you come to the end of yourself can you reach out truly for Jesus and grab onto everything that he is. Until you're holding onto yourself, excuse me, as long as you're holding onto yourself, you can't fully abandon your life to a life of faith, to walking out everything that Jesus died to impart to you and to give to you. You can't do it as long as you're holding onto yourself in any capacity. Man wasn't created to have within him a conscience. Again, these, some of these things, I know they sound weird because we've heard for so long. See, man, and I, and I shared this the last couple of weeks, if that statement about conscien conscience um, rubs you the wrong way, go back and listen to the last couple of weeks about part one and part two about no condemnation because here's the, here's the truth of the matter. Jesus never had to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Jesus never one time had to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In fact, when Adam did, God set cherubims to guard with the flaming sword to guard the tree of life. Because here's the deal. You can only partake and ingest of the fruit of one tree or the other. If you decide that you want to live your life by everything you can figure out, the, the tree, the knowledge of good, the knowledge of evil, trying to figure all the ways of this world out and trying to be, what you're doing is becoming a God to yourself. You want to make all the decisions and you want to know what's right, know what's wrong, be the final deciding factor in your life. You're either going to be able to ingest that fruit and have the fruit of that tree come out of your life, or you're going to abandon yourself to only feasting on the tree of life. Jesus came along and said he was that bread of life. 
See, he got it. He understood that there was no, there's no middle ground. Jesus didn't have to um, obey the law so he'd be right. Amen. Oh, you got to hear me. He didn't have to obey the law to be right. He knew he only had to listen to his father to be right. I'll say it one more time. Jesus did not have to obey the law to be righteous. He was righteous because he listened to his father. And he said, I only do the things that are pleasing to my father. I only do the things he tells me to do. I only say the things he tells me to say. I'm going to live this life no matter what any other man says. In fact, he said some things that he heard from heaven that every man completely thought he lost his mind. They were so mad. I'm not even talking about the good religious ones. All the, I'm gonna call them pastors. They're, they weren't pastors. They were Pharisees and Sadducees. But they were, they, they were the pastors of the day. They were the evangelists of the day. They were the clergy of the day. They were the people in, uh, in church that knew all the law forwards and backwards. And they were going to make sure that everybody else obeyed and, and stayed in line and everything like that. And Jesus came along with words from heaven downloaded from heaven into his inner man and said things like, before Abraham was, I am. And they picked up stones to try and kill him. He said, you're of your father, the devil. <laughs> can, you, can you imagine going into a place where, where somebody thinks that they're absolutely as pristinely right before God as anybody on the planet? And Jesus turned around to his disciples and said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, You'll in no wise, you'll, you'll have no way to partake of eternal life or enter the kingdom of heaven. How is that possible, pastor? I mean, they got it right. I mean, people read the, that verse of scripture and they, I've even heard it said by New Testament believers because I've only been around after the cross, right? I, you, you guys know I haven't been alive before the cross. <laughs> My whole life's been after the cross. So I've heard New Testament preachers Use that verse of scripture to tell you, you got to even be a little bit more on guard than even the Pharisees were. And I just shake my head and I'm thinking, my goodness, if they only understood when Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, he wasn't saying you need to get more righteous. He was saying, listen, don't, don't even worry about that. I'm just telling you that so that they could know my point, but just stick around because I'm going to give you my righteousness. Right. Would you have the, rather have the righteousness of the Pharisees or the righteousness of Jesus? Hello, that's a pretty easy answer, right? But so many people are trying to live out their righteousness and they, the only way they can get there is because of the law. And the, the book of Hebrews chapter 10 says that we need to have a heart that's sprinkled from an evil conscience. And if, let's, let's turn there quickly. Romans 10, verse 22, 23. Glory, glory, glory. Glory, glory. Hebrews 10, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So our hearts are sprinkled from an evil conscience, being fully assured of his love for you. Why? Because faith works by love, right? Faith works by love. So your, your, uh, your faith can only work when your heart has been sprinkled from an evil conscience. The love of God only does that. And it's the love of God showing you what Jesus did for you that makes all the difference. Now, what happens though, pastor? Because I know the enemy comes up against me all the time and the enemy has tried to tell me, um, you know, that I'm not good enough. You, you're talking about this um, accuser of the brethren. Boy, do I ever have some, uh, you might be thinking to yourself, boy, do I ever have some uh, experience with that? You know, he's always told me my whole life that I'm no good. Well, here's what your job is. If you'll turn to 1 John chapter three. 1 John chapter three. I'm going to start reading in verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Wow, that's a mouthful. And in fact, if you don't understand 
what that's talking about, you can think that this is just pointing you back to the Ten Commandments. Look at that, Pastor. Uh, put please on the screen verse uh, verse twenty two. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Why? Because we keep his commandments. See there, pastor, the commandments are good. We've got to keep, you know, those 10 commandments. You got to make sure that, you know, we, we figure all this stuff out and we keep ourselves in check and make sure we crucify our flesh and all these kind of things. Now, that's what an unrenewed uh, mind, that's how an unrenewed mind reads that scripture. A renewed mind goes on to the next and understands what the next verse says. Verse 23 says, and this is his commandment. Yes. Yes. That we should believe on... The, <laughs> look at this now. We should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. Yes. Where does it say anything about not killing anybody? Where does it say anything about not stealing? Where does it say anything about honoring your father and mother? Where does it say anything about the rest of the 600 commandments that people thought that they had to stay in line with to make themselves righteous? They're all summed up in love. Amen. Amen. Romans 13 makes that real clear. Real clear. And I've preached that so many times. Romans chapter 13, verses 10 through 12, 13. You can go read that yourself later on. But bottom line is, Paul says, if there's any other Commandment, it's summed up by saying, love your neighbor as yourself. Because he that loveth his neighbor hath, hath, old English meaning has already, has fulfilled the law already. You love your neighbor, you're not going to kill him, you're not going to steal from him, you're not going to cheat with his wife, you're not going to, uh, you know, covet his things, you're not, any of those things, if you allow love to do its job. And John got this, man. John understood that it was all about believing on Jesus and loving your neighbor. And he put them in the right order. Because when you believe on Jesus, the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. And you can only love because he first loved us. Yes. He says that in the next chapter, actually. We can only love because God first loved us. But now here's the thing. There's something hidden right in this, these four verses of Scripture. I just read, I think, four. It started in verse 18 through 22. Uh, I think that's five verses. But uh, there's something hidden right there in verse 19 that a lot of people don't ever see. It says this. Verse 19. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. The Amplified Bible in verse 19 says, By this we shall come to know, perceive, recognize, and understand that we are of the truth. And we, we, it's our job. The Holy Spirit doesn't do this. We can reassure, we quiet, we conciliate, we pacify our hearts in his presence. That's faith. That's the faith walk right there. Because when the, our heart condemns us, we've got to understand the next verse says that God's greater than our heart. Yes. Right? Put verse 20 on the screen. Back to the King James is fine. Verse 20 says, for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. But it's not just relying, sitting back and saying, well, my heart's condemning me. God, you got to show up again and you got to help me. No, the previous verse says that's your job. Yes. You pacify your heart. You conciliate your heart. It is way too quiet in here. Are you guys with me? Yes. I'm telling you, until we get this, we're going to be calling on the Lord to do things that he uh, allowed, uh, made room for 2,000 years ago and asks, is asking us to do every single day of our life, and we're waiting for him to do it two weeks from now. Right. And it doesn't work that way. We'll never get to the place where we can fully receive it until we stand up in faith and say, I'm not going to allow my heart to talk to me like that. I'm going to quiet my heart and I'm going to tell my heart exactly what Jesus has done for me. Because even if my heart condemned me, God's greater than that. And I know it and I'll believe it and I'll confess it because I've received it in Jesus name. That's how you live this life of faith. See, most believers know that Jesus' blood takes away sin, but very few of them understand that Jesus' blood also took away condemnation. They think that condemnation is just par for the course. It's just part of the life of the believer. As long as I'm around here, I'm going to have condemnation running in my life, and I'll just have to figure out how to do this thing. When righteousness the entire time is the key. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Verse 34, this is exactly how you get rid of any bit of sin in your life. How many of you 
would like to know, before you put it on the screen, please, please take it off the screen, 1 Corinthians 15, 34. But before you read it, how many of you would like a foolproof way to completely eradicate sin in your life? Really? There are some people that didn't raise your hands on that? <laughs> wow. Wow. I, some things, some people are, how many of you will not raise your hand no matter what I ask you? <laughs> I love you. Just raise your hand. Listen, this is the absolute, foolproof, lock-solid way to never allow sin to dominate your life. Never. You ready? 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Why is he saying this? This is the, this is the church that had prostitution in the temple. This is the church that were doing unspeakable things in God's house. And he wrote to them the worst, the most reprobate of all the churches, the most carnal. This is the church that he wrote to and said, I would like to speak to you as unto spiritual, but I can't. You're still carnal. You're like babes in Christ. I can't speak to you about spiritual things. This is the church. You guys with me? These are the people, right? And this is the very church that he also said, now, you would think that to this church, of any church, the ones that had the biggest problem, I mean, they were bringing in, um, you, know, uh, you know, bread and, and different things that were offered to idols and, and, and offered to the Lord, and they would take them out and they would, they would eat it unworthily in the back room. And I mean, there were just a lot of things that spiritually they didn't get right. And of any church, of any church, you would think that he would write to them and say, you need to clean your act up. You need to clean your act up. You need to get some things together, Corinthians. But he didn't. He wrote to them. Well, he did have some admonition, or, you know, to the, uh, you know, he admonished them for some things. But at the same time, he wrote to them and says, don't you know? King Jimmy says, no, ye not. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Wowzers of any church that he could have just absolutely scathed up one side and down the other and told them that they're no good, that they're not. He tells them, awake to righteousness. You guys are asleep to this, he's saying. Not you guys, some of you guys are too. But <laughs> he says, awake to righteousness. Awake to righteousness and sin not. And why is that? Because some people don't have the knowledge of God. You don't know how good God is in your life. You don't know how he's made you righteous. You don't know how he cleansed you through his son Jesus and is not holding anything against you. You don't know some of these things and I'm speaking this to your shame. You should have been way farther along than this by now, he's saying. But in the same token, he's saying, awake to righteousness and you won't sin. See, so many people think if I don't sin and then I don't sin and then I make another good choice and don't sin and then next week I don't sin and then next month I don't sin and three years from now I don't sin. Someday, 20 years from now, I'll be righteous. And he says it the complete opposite. He says, how about this? On day one, how about on minute one of day one, you awake to righteousness and you won't sin. If you woke up every day, the first thing on your mind was that you were the righteousness of God in Christ and that you were complete in Christ Jesus, who is the head of all principality, power, might, dominion, every name, this name, not only in this world, but that word which is to come. If you woke up with that on your mind and on your heart every single day, every day of your life, would you be in a rush and in a hurry to run out and sin and cheat on your taxes and cheat on your spouse and cheat at your job? No, that's the whole point. When you awake to righteousness and you know who you've been made to be, the rest of it flows effortlessly. I'm talking about effortlessly. People get mad when you talk about that, that the, the life of the believer should be an effortless life of faith. Why do I say effortless? Does it mean that you don't have to crucify your flesh sometimes? Of course you do. Does it mean you don't have to renew your mind? Well, of course you do, but you're doing that right now. Is this pretty easy to renew your mind? You hear the word of God and it renews your mind. That's, this is easy stuff. What I mean by effortless is you can live a life of faith pleasing to God with not trying to be the pleasing factor. When you understand that Jesus is the pleasing factor and I'm already right now complete in him. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. 
So I said a couple of weeks ago that I'll never preach to tell you where you're wrong or have fallen short. That my entire calling is to tell you what is right with you in spite of your weakness through Christ Jesus. That's my whole calling. That whole, listen, the communication of your faith, if you'll put Philemon verse six on the screen. For those of you taking notes, there's only one chapter in Philemon, so it's chapter one, verse six. <clears throat> Philemon verse six says this, the communication of your faith or you um, walking out, giving of your faith life, of you giving of yourself, the communication of your faith, Philemon 6, <laughs> that the communication of your faith, I'll have to turn there. All right. Hallelujah, it's right before Hebrews. Philemon 6, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual or effective. So you're walking out your spiritual life, your faith. You walking out and living your life of faith is only gonna become effective. It's gonna have a desired effect on your world around you. Watch. By the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. See, you think, you think that you're going to, you know, go out and give somebody some sob story of I'm no good and I'm so unworthy and I'm so, you know, whatever, and then try and uh, have your faith overcome a mountain and see a mountain dissipate and literally melt into the sea when you're talking about how unworthy you are. It doesn't work like that. When you acknowledge every good thing that's already on the inside of you, not that's going to come on the inside of you 20 years from now when you hear Pastor Anthony preach enough. See, I'm not preaching to get good things it, you know, get the finished work of the cross in you. I'm preaching these things to bring it out of you. <laughs> There's a massive difference, a massive difference. This is not trying to get you to a place where you're an overcomer. This is trying to get you to a place where you see that you're an overcomer. The eyes of your understanding need to be enlightened to the hope of his calling. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. And so we've, we've, I think a couple different times, Hebrews chapter eight, I'll read this uh, verse. I'm just gonna read verse 12. This is the end of like three verses about the, describe the covenant. It's Hebrews eight verses 10 through 12. For time's sake, I'm just gonna read verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. So God has not, he, he has made a conscious conscious decision to not bring up your past hurts and your past sin and your past shortcomings. He's not going to bring those up to you ever again. Amen. Okay. Now you can bring them up to him as much as he, as you want to, but the fact of the matter is that he has purposed in his heart to not bring them up to you. And he'd probably just really appreciate it if you didn't bring them up to him. Because <laughs> between you and God, one of you is trying to move forward and forget the past. And he's waiting for you to come into faith with him and come and get your faith in alignment with him so the two of you to go, go someplace together. Because yeah. if any two will agree is touching anything, <laughs> right? It'll be done to them by my Father in heaven. Well, yeah. the heavenly Father and you can be those two. Right. You can come into agreement with the word and the word is a living, breathing document. It's quick, it's alive, it's sharp, it's powerful, more powerful than any two-edged sword. Trying to cut that stuff out of your life if you'll just allow it to. So, in, in the Old Covenant, well, I, yeah, this, the Old Covenant is, is about a bunch of, you know, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, right? In the New Covenant, God's New Covenant is all based on I will. Old Covenant, God said, you don't. New Covenant, God said, I will. I'm going to try that over here. In the old covenant, it was all based on you don't. In the new covenant, it's based on I will. <laughs> and when we get that, when we get the I will of the new covenant, then we can come into a line with something much more greater than we are. And it's not based on you keeping it. This covenant is between God and Jesus. 
You understand what I'm saying? What I'm about to say for somebody in here is going to completely revolutionize the way you think about it forever. You do get to walk in new covenant realities. But the covenant truly, I mean, it is a covenant that he made with us, but the two covenanters, I don't even know if I'm, if I'm saying it right, the two people that came together to put the covenant together did not include you. Amen. It was between God and Jesus. Amen. Neither one of them can ever break their word. Neither one of them can ever lie. Neither one of them can ever fail. Neither one of them can ever go back on anything that they've ever purposed in their heart to do. And you, by faith, get to be part of the new covenant. Why? Because you're in Christ. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. This is not about you, church. This is not about you, church. This is not about you, church. This is about Jesus and his love for you, so he placed you on the inside of it. But it's not about your works. Not about your works. Oh, it's about you, I, I guess I should say. But it's not about your works. It's because he loved you so much. So the questions, got some um, questions that I'd like you to answer. They are hyp- not hypothetical. They're uh, proverbial questions. Did Jesus die? More participation. Did Jesus die? Yes. Was his blood shed? Yes. And so with, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. So have your sins been forgiven? Yes. Are you in Christ? Yes. Are you living by faith? Yes. If you're living by faith, has he placed you on the inside of the covenant? Yes. Okay, so since we've gotten all of that straight, before we break for the day, I'm going to start down just another road here. And that is law versus real life. See, people think that they can get their life from the law. And condemnation is that part of, on the, of the inside of you that is, um, we, I talked about last week, you guys remember uh, the picture I tried to paint for you of the sickly looking weed um, that had a lot of issues in your life that's above the surface and below the surface. There was stress, there was fear, and the deepest root was condemnation. I've asked those guys to have uh, a slide ready for us today. If you guys can put that up. Um, This is a a representation of that. So we have here, we have here a lot of things going on above the surface. A lot of things happening, you know, this this is what's visible. This is what people can see in your life. What they can't see is below the surface. They can't see the stress. They can't see the fear, and they can't see the condemnation. And if you guys can leave that up there for a few minutes, that, that would be just fine. Um, take a picture of it if, you, if you'd like to. Uh, but here's the, here's the thing, church. So many people are trying to deal with what's above the surface. They're trying to deal with all the things that everybody else can see, and they're trying to pull the weeds, and they're not getting the roots. Sometimes they're getting a little bit of the shallow roots, but they're not getting to the deepest root. And the, the, of course, you know, I talked about this last week, but stress can uh, lead to heart disease, high cholesterol, migraine, stroke, impotence, infertility. In fact, we've got uh, a brother here in our church, Arun, uh, who uh, is in his third year of medical school, right? He came up to me after, after church last week and said, you hit it right on the head, Pastor. That, you know, he, this was all resonating with him, Right. Uh, because he, they see a lot of this. The medical field sees a lot of the stuff on the top. You see the sickness. You see financial lack in your life. You can even see destructive habits in your life. But what you can't see are the things causing that. But stress, see, stress has no punch. Stress has no punch if there's no fear. Because if there's nothing to be fearful of, what could you possibly stress about? I'm going to say that again. If, you, if there's nothing to... To, to fear about, if there's, if there's no fear operating in your life, what's there to stress about? Amen. But see, fear is not the deepest root because what would you have to be afraid of if you didn't think that you were guilty at all in any, I'm talking about in any place, spiritually speaking, in any place where the father looks at you, which is the real deal. This is spiritual reality, okay? If you had no 
let me say it, let me say it the opposite way. If you had full assurance that God was holding nothing against you and there was nothing that he was condemning you about, if that was true, then why would you fear? Please put 1 John 4.18 on the screen. I'm going to read it in the uh, King James, and then I'm going to read it in the Amplified. 1 John 4.18. 1 John 4.18. There is no fear in love. Now watch this. I'm about to show you the correlation between fear and no condemnation. This is the same guy, the previous chapter, that says, if our heart condemn us, Right? So we have condemnation and we have fear by the same writer in the same really small book. There's just five short chapters here. And he says this, if our heart condemn us, God's greater than our heart and it's your job to conciliate and pacify like the Amplified said. It's your job to pacify your heart and assure, the King James says, that in this we will assure our hearts before God, right? Now he gets to the meat of it later on in the next chapter. He says this. He says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Watch this. Because fear hath torment. Fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. There's the connector. So there's no fear in love. The King or the Amplified says it this way. There is no fear in love. Watch this. Dread does not exist. For those of you that have been around a while, you've heard me teach on this. There is really only, uh, there's really only fear. Um, the Bible talks about fear a lot. Let me say it this way. But the reality is fear manifests different ways in different times of your life. In your past, fear manifests as regret. I didn't make the right decision. I didn't pick the right, uh, you know, um, whatever course for my life, or I didn't do this right, I didn't do that right. So you have a lot of regrets that's just fear raising its ugly head to manifest the condemnation that's really down in there if you'd only open your eyes and see it. Right. You're spiritualized. Right. But now in the future, fear manifests itself as dread. Some of you guys, it's you know, really not in this church much, but I, I even know a lot of believers. Oh, Monday's coming. Dreading Monday. Start dreading Monday on Friday. I mean, it used to be people would dread Monday morning on Sunday night. But now some people don't even enjoy their weekend because I just finished up work. And man, these weekends go by so fast. Monday's coming, man. Before you know it, it's going to be here. They think about what Monday morning is going to be like and they forget that, you know, enjoy Saturday and enjoy Sunday. And sometimes Sunday they come and they're thinking, they're sitting in church. Now, nobody in here is doing this today because you guys are real spiritual people. But sometimes people come in and sit in church and they're thinking about other things. And they're texting other people. <laughs> and looking at other articles. And Googling stuff. And wondering why they can't get the ultimate. Now, I understand that if the sermon's horrible, I've done that too. <laughs> I, and I'm not going to be the judge of this. You guys can be the judge. But in my estimation, I don't think I've preached a bad one in 11 years because I'm preaching about Jesus. I'm preaching about his finished work of the cross. I'm trying to give you life. Yeah. I've not preached self-help one time in 11 and a half years that we've, I've been pastoring this church. I haven't preached self-help self -help one time. This is what I'll preach from the very beginning, ladies and gentlemen. This is what I'll preach if the Lord tarries and I get to preach for another 50 years. This is what I'll preach for the next 50 years. Amen. And I will not get caught in that trap. Of, oh, is this, this is a get boring. You're preaching the same things. Well, let's get it. Let's rise up and let's get to the place where we take it to the world and start reproducing ourselves and seeing all these empty chairs. I'm not supposed to preach to this chair today. Yeah. Amen. I'm not supposed to preach to that chair today. There's supposed to be somebody between me and the chair. I'm telling you, but you know, I, even though I am, I'm a sheep also, but sheep reproduce sheep. Here's the thing. When the church does its job, and we're going to make it easy for you. We've got some things that we're going to hand out for you, some different things to help invite people to church. And we're going to, we'll introduce that next week to you. There's some things that we've got in our back pocket, so to speak, because we're going to start evangelizing. We're going to start soul winning. We're going to see, I'm telling you, we're going to win this city. Amen. We're going to win this city. I'm telling you, we're going to win this city. And here's the deal. It's not, it's not just my job to get people in the seats. Watch this. 
It's going to go cross grain of your thinking. It's not you, it's not your job to blow it off on me to get people in the seats. Here's how you do that unknowingly. You need to come here, my pastor, he's preaching a great series on this. You need to, see that's still, it's still get me getting people in the seats. Now watch this. Watch the difference. When you switch this gear, maybe it's, it'll all be different. We won't have enough chairs. Watch this. Man, guess what the Lord's been showing me? You don't, don't ever say my name. Don't ever say my name. I don't care. I don't want any of this glory. Don't ever say that I preach this. Say, guess what the Lord showed me? I know you're dealing with some stuff. There's, there's stress. There's fear in your life. If you pray about it, and if you actually do what you're called to do, the Holy Spirit will reveal it to you because I don't know this person you're going to talk to tomorrow morning at your work. But the Lord knows them, and you know them. And when you spend some intimate time with the Lord, goes to what I was talking about, being thankful, being joyful, and you go to them and you say, listen, the Lord showed me some things about condemnation and I know that you're feeling condemned about your past. I've heard you talk around the water cooler for the last 10 years and I know condemnation's your problem. But I know that Jesus wants to get it off of you because I used to deal with condemnation too. And he changed my life. He completely radically transformed me. And I can pray with you and we can pray that off of you right now. And in the name of Jesus, you'll never be the same again. And then when they start melting in tears and they, and they absolutely, their lives change right before your face, then you can invite them to church. See, it's your job to be a fisher of men. Amen. Go out. When we leave today, go fishing. <laughs> go fishing for men when we leave. And as soon as that happens, bring them in here and let Jesus clean them up. Amen. Yes. You don't clean the fish. It's not your job to clean the fish. Pull them in the boat. Right. Let's pull the nets in together. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, give the Lord Jesus a shout, man. That's the gospel. That's the whole reason I showed up today. I'll say this. My time's running out. Um, you know, I'm not even going to get into the rest of it because if I do, <laughs> uh, I'll just uncork another bottle and we will just drink of the Spirit for another hour. So I'm not going to do that right now. Hallelujah. How many of you have received something today? Yeah? Are you glad you came? I'm glad I came. And here's the thing. When we finally get to the place where we understand our role, every single one of our role is to be a light for Jesus. Let his light shine through us. The, um, Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verse 8 says, You were one, at one time darkness. Now are you light. Walk then as children of light. So as, if you go allow this light to shine, and once you step out, and you get to the place where you are seeing people changed in your life and you're hauling the nets in and bringing them in, then we can have an absolute disciple-making factory in here. Because you guys are being discipled. I'm doing my job. I know I'm doing my job. And you're doing your job by coming. That's half your job. But bring somebody with you. Right? What, have anybody ever heard the verse of scripture? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Yes. Amen. Did you notice that the person that wrote that was invited by somebody to go to church? Yeah. I was so glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. We think people are going to come without inviting them. The gladness, the joy comes and springs up on the inside of somebody when you say, hey man, let's go. Let's go to church together. Amen? Amen. You guys ready to change Lebanon? We'll start with Lebanon. Are you guys ready to change Lebanon? Yeah. Amen. Give the Lord a shout. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to this channel and share this video with a friend today. And remember, most importantly, that Jesus is Lord and you are complete in Him.